My name is Julia Halperin. I'm the executive editor of Artnet News. And I want to welcome everybody as you're coming in to the second Artnet talk in a three-part series with Art Market Mentors, a new mentorship program pairing art market professionals with established members of the industry. Um, and the goal of this whole talk series is to you know, help the art industry adapt to the you know, unusually rapid changes that are underway uh, within the past year. And today, uh, Caroline Cyan, a co-founder of Art Market Mentors, is gonna lead us in a discussion about new digital career paths in the art world. So we're gonna have 45 minutes of conversation with our amazing panelists, and we will leave uh, some time for questions at the end. So if you have questions that come up throughout the conversation, please leave them in the chat field uh, at the bottom middle of your Zoom screen. Uh, we will get to as many as we can. And uh, if you have other people uh, who want to watch this later but couldn't make it today, um, we will have a video available of the full conversation later this week on our YouTube channel. Thank you so much. Over to Caroline. Thank you, Julia. Thank you so much. Hi to everybody. As uh, Julia said, we're here to talk about charting rewarding new career paths in the digital art world. Um, I'm Caroline Sand, I'm an art market veteran um, to those who don't know me. And I'm also recently a co-founder of Art Market Mentors with my uh, with Kat Menson, who was our moderator last month um, for the ArtNet Talks. Today, um, we're gonna have a great panel of speakers who are gonna walk us through what's been happening in the market as well as helping you navigate it for the future. Doesn't have to be said, but the last year, the art market in its entirety went into the digital space. For years, for many of us, more traditionally, I was in the auction house, we dipped our toes in and let's be honest, we were skeptical and we had a lot of caution around it. We questioned often, will our clients go there? Will our clients spend there? And how much will they spend there? And last year answered that question in a loud, loud space of yes. Yes, they will spend there. And we also saw them spending at a level that we've never seen before. Um, the results from auctions, art fairs, galleries, and all the you know, individuals on this call show us that demand online is not only for access to look at art, but also access for click and buy. And so today we're gonna to talk about the impact on this, on your businesses, on your careers, what's the lasting impact of last year and how can you leverage it in your business and your personal uh, career moving forward. Our panel um, today is an amazing group of people who are gonna help inform you and talk about some of those trends, educate you and also share advice and tips on how you can empower yourself and your business around this important topic. So let's get to the panel. We're gonna start with Annie Wang. Uh, raise your hand so everyone, well, I guess everyone has their names on it, but um, <laughs> yeah, she's a vice president head of marketing at Artnet. Um, we have Sean Green, who is the founder and CEO of Artinal, a technology company focused on bringing client relationship management technology into the art world. We have Louise Hamlin, director and founder of the Art Business Conference and Art Mavens, a UK app-based community designed for global networking for professionals in the art committee. And last and not least is Tatiana Berg, our glo the global social media manager for Art Basel. Um, we're gonna go through this. We're gonna walk through the panel. We're gonna have a couple of questions for the panel then we're gonna open it up to everybody on this call. Um, we're gonna start large with the big market and then we're gonna go to personal. So I encourage everybody to stay because you're going to learn something today around the market at large, as well as what you can do personally to um, navigate it. So um, Annie, I'm gonna start with you because you are um, part of ArtNet and with ArtNet's many channels from the database to the news channel, I think you guys have a really good um, pulse on where the market is. We saw in the first half of last year, um, online auctions jumped 400, over 480% um, into the hundreds of millions. Um, Phillips, Christie, Sotheby's joining, players already there like Artsy, Artnet, and First Dibs. After that dramatic shift in 2020, and we're starting to see vaccines and whatever the new normal is coming through, what are we seeing and what do you think the trends are going to be around the market in 2021 and on? Yeah, so I think to, to take a step back from that question, Caroline, as you said, the art world, not just auction houses, have been tremendously slow to embrace the online space. You know, Sotheby's didn't even have online sales until I was there in 2016. 
Um, and, and the question is, you know, why is digital important? And can we really, really understand the answer to that? The answer is that nobody actually lives in the art world. Art buyers live in the world period and a huge part of, you know, the world is now online. And what the, the pandemic has done is essentially, you know, accelerate the embrace of purchasing art online. Um, and it's really moved a lot, of, a lot of things forward that otherwise would have inevitably happened anyway. And they would have inevitably happened for a lot of tangible and intangible reasons. But one of them that's really big is that we are currently undergoing the largest wealth transfer in history. So in the next 10 years, over $4 trillion is gonna pass hands. And as we know, a lot of that wealth is gonna be concentrated at the top. So you're seeing Gen Z, I'm sorry, maybe not Gen Z, some Gen Z, uh, you're seeing Gen X and you're seeing millennials come into wealth. You're seeing them get older and really have earning power and spending power and you need to meet them where they are. So to answer your question, Caroline, of you know what's gonna happen with digital sales going into 2021, I think we're all realizing galleries, auction houses, art fairs, um, artists, that having a strong digital presence, this is becoming table stakes. This is really no longer optional if you want to have a viable business. I had read somewhere that um, actually the largest group of um, new collectors engaged in these online platforms was from, from millennials and that they were the most enthused and positive about the opportunities that new technologies and online and, and kind of uh, opening access to everybody um, uh, of, of the multiple generations. Yeah, exactly. I think um, I might be misquoting this. I think it was actually Basel, though, that did do a report on galleries during the pandemic. And they had surveyed that millennials had actually noted buying work for $1 million or more online, but no boomers that they surveyed um, had actually spent a million dollars or more online. I think di digital art sales is also uh, private, done privately. Uh, yeah, I think it's going to be a trend as well. Uh, you have, uh, I don't, I'm sure all of us subscribe to or are part of the Bear Facts. And, you know, Josh Bear uh, has, if, if you've noted in some of his newsletters, he's put, you know, private sales that he's trying to uh, encourage, you know, leveraging his newsletter. Um, there's a young lady who just built out her MVP, you know, obviously being in the tech space with Arthur, I'm looking at a lot of this stuff. She built out an MVP. Her name is Yelena. Uh, and her MVP is or Origin, O-R-I-G-E-N. Mm. And her platform is about helping collectors who want to be able to sell to each other. Uh, we saw Loic, Loic uh, Guzer, or I don't want to pronounce his no, last name. No, you got name. it, you got it. <laughs> uh, launch fair warning. You know, Artsy is trending in this direction. And, and for our internal, you know, it's about the relationship. And so we've been focused, you know, a lot on, on the relationships and relationships guide private sales. And with the pandemic, you know, we've always said that private sales are going to continue to trend up. It's just the infrastructure that's not there. And these players are working on infrastructure. So I think that's also key. And I, I would just add for Artnet, you know, it's been interesting for us because our infrastructure has actually been there for 30 years. Um, Hans Neuendorf really launched this company alongside the birth of the internet itself back in the day. And we celebrated our 30th anniversary um, last year. And actually two years ago now, time has a whole different quality during the pandemic. Um, but we, we've seen tremendous amounts of engagement across our auction platform. The average sale price is going up. We're getting a lot more engagement with uh, galleries. So anyone who's subscribing to our gallery network is getting far more inquiries than they used to. And I don't think that any of us deny that art is first and foremost about, you know, culture and community. Um, and these are things for which you just need brick and mortar and you need in-person events. Um, but there, there really is a cultural shift. I think, you know, in 2021, uh, if the pandemic ends this year, we're going to see events come back with a fury. We're going to see people really want to do one-to-one -one sales. Um, but the habits and the acceptance of online transactions is for sure here to stay. Um, I want to note also we had our uh, one of our guests last time was um, Shlomi Ravi, who started um, Greenhouse Auctions, which is also connecting artists right to collectors. 
And then uh, we also saw a trend on Instagram where uh, works were going up on Instagram and having kind of flash sales and purchasing. And uh, I think the trend I see is reducing barriers between buyer and artist or seller um, that's evolving within the market. Um, uh, so that's the front of the market. Let's talk about other parts of the market where we're um, creating, you know, where tech and digital is, is kind of impacting us. And um, Sean, this is going to be for you. Um, I'm thinking of, you know, to be digital, it requires examining, you know, end-to-end -end process and doing business and understanding where value really is. And from a traditional point of view, the art market has always struggled because to, to, um, to sell art and handle art, they're unique pieces of works, they're unique collectors. And it has always been a very, um, uh, it's always struggled with this slight inefficiency. Um, but as we see this evolution of digital and companies coming in that are really bringing wonderful products to the market that are streamlining that parts of our business and creating new value and efficiencies, it also could be to our audience um, either requiring them to have new skills or understanding in their job to stay relevant or, um, or job elimination at the worst case scenario. Um, do you have, you know, what can people do to be either stay on track or feel relevant on that side or, um, or update their skills and, and, and try to move into that digital artwork? What is your, your view on this? Because I know, I know you're very active in this space. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I think just the industry right now, there's a lot of people who, who are trying to figure out where a whole bunch of shifts are going. Um, I, you know, obviously being tech, a tech founder, we focus on the user and focus on user experience. And so anybody who's, who's currently, you know, looking for a job or figuring out what's like, how's the better way to engage people, there's programs out there like General Assembly um, that, that has a user experience program. And I think tooling up, you know, what you have to offer is key, whether you're working, you know, with, with at some point, you know, within different parts of the industry, um, or you're trying to figure out how to break into the industry because you're coming from outside. I think helping the tech companies that are in this space, you know, like, you know, Annie was mentioning Artnet and what they're doing with their, you know, private sales and auctions and things like that. And if you're looking to break in, you want to be able to come with, you know, that, ex that experience. And if you were working at a gallery before and understand trying to figure out how to transition to digital, you know, I'm sure they're trying to figure out how to serve, you know, that, that private sale audience or that auction audience. And if you come with that user experience background, of like, Hey, I come from this world. I know how it operates, but I've also leveled up and, and got like a quick uh, boot camp done with um, uh, general assembly and, and understanding the user experience and how the, the user connects to the product. I think that's like very key. Uh, but also galleries, and art world uh, or, or art professionals traditionally don't have a good understanding of marketing mm -hmm. and how marketing can be done well and better, how to target audiences, how to understand who's engaging, when they're engaging, how often. And so finding a way to uh, get that experience, you know, it's not just about like knowing how to use Instagram or, or, you know, any, any sort of social, it's about like the data behind these platforms and how to leverage data. Sometimes data has been a dirty word <laughs> in the art world and in this market, but it, it, like face it, like everybody needs, needs to be data, data oriented. And if you can bring that level of expertise, especially inside these galleries or these private sales businesses and things like that, you, you se separate yourself apart from the pack because you understand how audiences engage, how they would like to engage, how you can target messaging toward them and leverage ad buying and things like that. You know, so you can be able to just take their audience from, you know, the, 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 the tight mold that it's in and expand the audience again to Annie's point of like, there's like $4 trillion of new money coming in and new, you know, yeah. new collectors and, and ways that people want to in, engage and interact. How do you like, who are these people? How do you tap them? How do you engage with them? This is what like picking up these new marketing practices. And there's a whole bunch of programs on how, on how to do this well. YouTube 
can help you do this well, right? And so those are just some of the, the, the areas that, you know, I would say are key in terms of being able to figure out how you can fit yourself back into the ever growing shift in the landscape. I would also say, Sean, um, and you and I talked about this earlier, when we talk about marketing, there's the traditional concept of printed ads and kind of static space. But um, can you talk a little bit uh, around the trend um, where clients are wanting more content and educational kind of, I guess you could call it marketing or, or, or information to be able to help them build their, their kind of ability to navigate um, their collecting taste? Yeah, and it, it begins with like nurturing, right? You want to be able to help, you know, galleries, you know, haven't been the best at nurturing their clientele. I mean, if I'm hearing that a collector uh, was waiting to hear back from a dealer because they're trying to buy a piece, it means that there's some disconnect there. And and dealers have been known to chase the, car the carrot, <laughs> you know, uh, that, that's like right in front of them. But there's so much richness in their audience and who's trying to pay attention and, and, and being able to help curate your content to people, not just spray and pray with your newsletters and like hope that it hits and something <laughs> sticks, like actually understand your audience and tailor that content, you know, to your audience and figure out who are lookalike audiences that you should be paying attention to so that you're giving tailored communication to these people. Because there's a lot of people out there who want to buy art, right? The, the market's not starving for people who want to buy. The market's starving for how to communicate effectively to those people. And content is king and, the, and king and queen. And, and, yeah. and galleries have so much content. It's just how do you help them organize their information and then disseminate it effectively so it's tantalizing in Instagrammable bite chunks, like or or Twitter like chunks, right? Because I when I I mean, the press release to me, I don't even relate to it. So, you know, and other people may share share that, right? Give me the Instagram, Twitter, give me the like, inst give me the IG reel, right? <laughs> of like what my press release is. And then I'm like, oh shoot, I, I like, this is engaging. I wanna actually participate in this, go see the show, go do that, right? Sean, I, I couldn't agree more. And you said exactly what, I was trying to convey when I said that no one lives in the art world, they live in the world. And you have to understand the world that your customer lives in. Um, and this is true for you know, retailers in the luxury sphere. This is true for consumer packaged goods like Kraft macaroni and cheese. And this is true for the art world. And I, I think you're totally right that um, the art world has not traditionally embraced marketing because there hasn't been so much marketing you could do and track. You know, I did buy a lot of full page New York Times ads uh, when I was at Sotheby's, but I don't know how effective those were. Uh, but I do know how effective my programmatic advertising is. And to your other point, it's, it's not just about, you know, digital metrics and certainly nobody needs to go and become an expert in performance marketing, right? But if you're a sales director, if you're a gallery owner, um, perfecting your communication and your clarity across text and email is probably something that you've done during this pandemic. I would also say I'm personally going to start using the term spray and pray yes. on a regular prayer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but Sean, I think a great, a great point you make is, um, and I'm learning it personally, is understanding your your audience, depending on your platform. And we'll probably touch more on that with Tatiana, but there are different, you know, people go to different um, platforms for different types of consumption or style. Um, and it, it, it's a critically important thing. Um, I would also say I checked out General Assembly after we spoke and I would recommend to everybody on this call to check it out. There are lots of free to reasonable costs courses that are relevant and they even help you understand you think you take a quiz under which what you're trying to learn about and they direct you towards it and it was a resource I hadn't known before we talked and I, I really appreciated um, that from you Sean thank you um, so to the point of what Annie was saying before we're, we're social animals uh, the art market is a very social space um, and um, understanding where we're gonna go. We used to gather art exhibits, art openings, auctions, events, 
art fairs. I can't forget those. It's our currency. Um, how big your network, how much you can see people. We're also, the art market in general is very uh, creative. We, we kind of like are kinetic when we're together and you often find ideas or opportunities when you're in a room or talking about stuff, whether it be uh, somebody looking for a, a piece of art, a collection, or just a, an opportunity around an amazing exhibit or, or otherwise. And, and we get kind of the energy there. Louise, this is for you. Um, I think because you've done the gamut from conferences and now with your new app, which is um, uh, leveraging kind of online um, networking. Um, how do we, what do we see the, the future of how do we get together? How do we keep networking? How do we keep finding those moments where we're really finding that energy that you can really only find when you're talking together? Um, and without the traditional art market gathering points for meeting clients, networking or viewing art, um, can you share a little bit with us your viewpoint and, and, and what you're seeing in the market around how to stay connected? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and firstly, thank you for asking me to join today um, and to Artnet and Art Market Mentors for hosting um, such an important conversation. Um, Caroline and Kat, I think your initiative Art Market Mentors is so timely um, and such a great force for good for the art community during these difficult times. Um, Caroline, you're absolutely right. The art market is um, an incredibly social group by nature. Um, and it's built around those regular touch points that you've mentioned, exhibitions, gallery openings, auctions, of course, art fairs, um, and indeed conferences. And for those numerous opportunities to network. And I think during this tumultuous year with not being able to host the art business conference in real life, I've been working on developing a digital platform that would enable and support art market professionals to stay together and stay connected, um, to share expertise, resources, and kind of foster those deeper conversations and a greater sense of connoisseurship. Um, where I think we've seen a return to hyper-local in the art world, which is positive on a number of levels, particularly for sustainability, um, and for local engagement. Um, my focus, I guess, is on the platform and enabling um, and, and hosting digital tools to keep people in touch, to grow a global network of art peers and opportunities. And I also think from the career perspective, I think we're seeing a fundamental shift more towards more flexible working patterns. I think in particular freelance careers. Um, and so the platform will also help and enable those seeking that gear change for their career to offer independence, flexibility, um, definitely additional income opportunities. Um, my view is there's, is there's such a great wealth of knowledge and expertise across the many different layers of the art market um, and where we believe we've we're developing these digital tools to help create freelance opportunities worldwide. Thank you, Louise. I think uh, I think the more that we can stay connected and not, you know, and kind of share and reduce barriers, and it's definitely what the art market mentors is trying to do, which is um, get people to collaborate and talk and navigate this market as best they can. And as we all know, the, going back to normal, we'll have a heavy digital presence to it, no matter what happens. And, and that's a good thing. I personally think it's a good thing. I think it will open up this market, really reduce barriers and, and bring more people, whether it's collectors or colleagues into um, what I think we all feel is a fantastic market and space to be and, and career to have. I think Clubhouse has also been pretty interesting. Yeah for you know conversation and and cross collaboration and meeting new people i mean in terms of I like i like spontaneous combustion so like the whole pandemic has been you know that's been mute for like me meeting and running into people and connecting and figuring out how, how i can help how they can help me and like i thrive on that stuff so you know clubhouse has been an interesting place to find the like spontaneous combustion of people and engagement and, and, and doing it purely through audio. And I like seeing the influx of, of art people who, who've been coming into that space. And 
it's been really interesting. You know, we're seeing all the usual suspects <laughs> in there. Uh, and it's, it's been fun to engage. Uh, so, you know, we, we, we actually also have a, a club in there called Step Into the Art World uh, that, you know, we host talks and conversations and things like that. Um, and hopefully, you know, I can host y'all as, <laughs> as well for one of our talks. It's all about like helping people understand and we want to bring like the real quote unquote art world into Clubhouse as well. So, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's so great. I haven't had a chance to dive into Clubhouse too much myself, but when I think about social media, it, the two things I think it can do the best is networking and storytelling. Uh, and I can't help but think about how, um, I think I first became aware of Arternal and Sean uh, through your social media presence. I seem to recall uh, seeing you as like a very uh, enthused and engaged um, presence on Instagram, leaving really thoughtful, interesting comments on Artnet's Instagram page back uh, when I was there, uh, which is a great example of putting yourself out there, joining the mix and uh, sort of making your presence more widely known. I, I want to pipe into that as well, because I met Sean at this point, maybe seven years ago when you had a completely different business. Yeah. That was incredibly clever. I met you and your business partner. I think you had an aggregator, like an app to show where gallery shows are, which was like yeah. actually radical. And now you have this amazing business. And um, it's, it's so impressive how you've really, really been able to carve out true new digital spaces that never existed before in art. It's really impressive. Yo, I, I appreciate both you ladies, <laughs> you know, all you ladies, you know, it, it, it's a, it, you know, for, for us, it was just about, about finding the lane. And, and I think what's important about this audience is like finding your lane, right? And, and seeing where you fit and not being afraid to put yourself out there and iterate and use the mediums that exist. And it, it's allowed me to connect <laughs> with the people who are, you know, on, on this panel. So that's what's awesome about about tech, like as Tatiana's mentioning, and and like Annie, <laughs> you know, it's been like you've seen the the whole journey and path, and and, and Louise, you know, <laughs> as well. So yeah, no, it's it's really cool, and I'm glad to be on this panel with y'all. Well, thank you. So so now we're gonna get personal. I'm kidding. No, we are gonna get personal because we've we've gone from the big market down to um, kind of the different layers, and now um, this question's for Tatiana um whose uh, world is social media and that's her expertise and i get often asked around and i know the pressure to have high followers on instagram different social media as a business as a person in the art world i've seen a lot of competition between you know individuals around how many likes they get shares they get um in building content and particularly during these times during a pandemic it's even harder to build that that content um, can you share with us a little bit about the future of social media? Because I see it moving very quickly. Um, and this is all social media. It's from your Instagram. It's, um, I'm personally uh, gotten onto TikTok because of my 13 year old twin, um, <laughs> but Facebook, LinkedIn. Um, in my experience now, you're having your social, your, your, your social media presence is inherently linked in either with your career as it, it relates to either your colleagues or yourself or your clients, or if you're looking to upgrade or if you're in transition, um, you're constantly linking in your LinkedIn or they're looking at your content. Um, what are the trends you're seeing? Where is it going? And then most importantly, you know, for people who are dipping their toe in as we talked about it, um, what are some advice that you have for them and what's important and what's not? Um, I, I really get that question a lot. So Tatiana, over to you. <laughs> Absolutely. It's a big question and definitely an important one. I mean, what Annie said at the start of this talk, uh, there has been a tremendous move online this past year, uh, and it certainly seems that it will at least in part be permanent. Uh, and we've really seen social media emerge as like a really important part of that move. Um, in terms of ongoing trends, I really see Instagram consolidating its leading role in online art. Uh, I'm going to cite the Hiscox report that came out, I believe, in January, uh, which did a, a pretty great survey of about 500 collectors. So admittedly a smaller sample size, but we know that in the art world, uh, even that size can be very, um, very influential. 
And among them, over two thirds said that Instagram was their social media platform of choice for art. And nine out of 10 new art buyers and millennials said that they were using it for art related purposes. So it's really uh, the place that you wanna be. Facebook, on the other hand, has slowly become less relevant. In that survey, only 23% of buyers said that it was their preferred social media channel, uh, while, but conversely, LinkedIn has uh, continued to rise. Uh, so it's become an important channel for both buyers and art world professionals to sort of develop their art world network professionally. What surprised me personally was that collectors said that they were also using it to get in touch directly with artists on that platform. Uh, which I'd heard, I, I certainly think has become more common on Instagram. I was less aware of that being the case on LinkedIn. But when it comes to maintaining, whether it's your own personal social media business or your brands, uh, you certainly wanna make yourself as accessible as possible and make sure that your presence is, reflects yourself or your business accurately. Uh, as Annie said, it's certainly, uh, it's no longer optional. Uh, that being said, there's a lot of spaces out there and you don't have to be everywhere. Uh, so I think it's best to sort of consolidate on the platforms that are most relevant to you. Uh, and I think for most of us, that would probably be Instagram primarily. Uh, it's a really versatile uh, platform that gives you a lot of different ways of communicating. And then certainly also your LinkedIn, which is a more professional networking space, uh, which nevertheless has seen a lot of expansion of its tools and resources. So there's a lot of things you can do in that space. Um, maybe I can start with a couple of tips and we can sort of, once we get to audience questions, we can get to more specifics. Uh, but as I previously said, I think that storytelling and networking are the most important. Networking could take the place of uh, commenting on other people that you think are interesting in a thoughtful and interesting way. Not obsessively, you don't want to comment on it. <laughs> Uh, I've, I've seen someone take that advice very literally before, so I wanted to make sure to make that clear. Um, and also making sure that you are put, you're generously putting out content regularly. Um, that's the other side of the coin, right? Storytelling. Uh, so I think it's really important for you to find your own voice uh, in that space. And while you certainly don't want to adopt the spray and pray method of just putting it all out there, the nice thing about social media is that it's here today and gone tomorrow. So it does allow for some experimentation. So I would urge you to uh, not let perfect be the enemy of good, but to get out there and start making posts and sort of figuring out through trial and error what authentically represents you or your business uh, and what has what's connecting with your audience. Um, and Ideally, you wanna be posting every single day. I realize that can be a lot. It's certainly a lot of work, but leading up to it, maybe getting up to at least three to five times a week. Um, and then sort of as you become more comfortable uh, adding more and more. Um, but yeah, it's a more casual space than a lot of other online platforms. Um, Instagram stories, especially, since there are different ways to post on Instagram, you can you know, make your in-feed posts a little more robust with like a thoughtful in-depth caption. And then your story is a more playful everyday space. Um, so I would really encourage you to think about on your social media presence, what are you offering to your audience? It's not easy to get people to start to follow a new account. So you really want to make sure that you're offering up content that perhaps informs, entertains, engages them on some way. You don't want to always be selling. Uh, you want to make sure that you're offering up some something that your audience will want. Um, so thinking deeply about what you're interested in, what you would like to see, what you think your clients would be interested in seeing. Tatiana, what about hashtags? <laughs> Great. I, I get that question all the time. And it, it, I, I find a lot of people get kind of caught up in that that's, that's the most important part of it. But I would say absolutely not. Um, I realize this might be a little controversial, but I think hashtags are kind of meh. Like, to be honest, they're not, they're not as relevant as they used to. If you click on a hashtag, most of them are so cluttered, uh, they rendered themselves useless. Uh, the exception maybe being artist names, I find that those are really useful and collectors, for example, report using those uh, artist hashtag names uh, to discover new works by the artist. I think location tags are far more useful uh, than hashtags. So if you're making a post about, uh, an, 
a gallery show or even an artist studio visit that you went to, having a location tag uh, is a better way of making your, your content found. Don't sweat the hashtags too much. Sweat more putting out interesting content, communicating directly with interesting people. Um, if you find that you, uh, make sure that you're following interesting people too and like engaging with their content, leaving comments for them, showing that you're interested. Uh, it will likely result in like a, a positive back and forth that way. So don't sweat the con the hashtags. Make sure your picture, your images are, are on point. Uh, shoot vertically in natural light when you can. Um, and don't worry about the hashtags too much. Um, I think I have a good question uh, for the group. Um, we, we had a question come in about um, for digital art market initiatives, um, what were successful during the pandemic and what initiatives were less helpful and unlikely to continue after the pandemic? Uh, why don't I start with you, Tatiana, and then if you guys, let's work around if you guys have uh, thoughts on that. Sure. Well, actually, the first one that comes to mind isn't even uh, only uh, limited to social media, but it's online conversations like this. Um, whereas I would certainly attend many in-person uh, conversations. I didn't uh, have the opportunity or wasn't, didn't seem as many online conversations that I think make things more accessible, can bring together people who might not be able to travel together um, and have this kind of conversation. Uh, same thing with whether it's on Zoom or Instagram Live, lots of different places. I think that's been a positive development. Uh, maybe it'll continue through uh, live streaming in-person events once they return. But I, I definitely see that as a positive development that I hope is here to stay. I think pricing transparency is, mm -hmm. is an incredible development. Um, they say, you know, to Tatiana's habits, <laughs> you know, we, we built a lot of habits. I think they say it's like 21 days to form a habit. There's been a lot of 21 days in, in repeat uh, since the start till now. Uh, and see, I don't, I want to see how the physical fair is going to treat pricing um, because everything digital is available now. And it's allowed the market to understand, you know, what primary prices look like because that's been hidden for a while. So when you can balance that against what you're seeing in the secondary and like auction houses, et cetera, at least you have some way to negotiate um, and not, you know, weirdly like tip your toe into a booth, you know, just like you're going into a cold swimming pool, but you can actually like properly walk in and have some data to back you up. It allows you to flex a bit more. And so being able to have, you know, more honest conversation around these things, I think is key and transparency uh, from our perspective, you know, at our terminal, you know, it'll lead to a more open market. There's, there's $2 trillion worth of art assets in private hands. 70 billion ish is traded on a annual basis. That means you can double up, triple up, quintuple the market and still not drive a huge dent in 2 trillion. So with pricing visibility comes, you know, more liquidity and, and people who, who can engage better. And that's about an infrastructure and, and we're all talking about different parts of infrastructure to allow you know, the market to engage. So that's, that's what I think. I think that's such a good point, Sean, because art um, in terms of galleries and auction houses is, is very similar to the luxury industry where it's really about recruitment. If you look at the churn rate at Sotheby's or Christie's or Rolex, you know, you might be surprised by how many people buy something only one time, but that's a really, really big portion of your revenue, the one-time buyer. Most people don't own many, many Rolexes. Mm -hmm. um, and if you are a mid-tier gallery, you know, you really want to constantly be recruiting people into your program and buying in. And it's intimidating when there's not prices. It's not friendly. And I think this goes back to, you know, what we talked about previously. There's a real cultural shift. You know, people may not want the uniform doorman anymore and you know the intimidating girl at the front desk they might want a little bit of efficiency and transparency um, and i think that for almost everybody except maybe the blue chip galleries that are you know only selling to select collectors transparency is only going to help you 
Um, speaking of transparency, we got a question, which I think is an interesting one. We got them, we got it twice. Um, one from an artist that is actually showing their work on Instagram um, and getting kind of traction there and trying to make a decision whether he continues to promote or he or she, sorry, I don't know who it is, um, uh, on Instagram versus going through a gallery. And then we got a similar question from somebody with the same theme of, do you see the transparency and kind of ability for artists to be able to market directly to collectors? What do we see, or I know we can't read or we don't know for sure, but do you have any thoughts on what that might impact on kind of the gallery or the, the middleman between the artist and the collector moving forward with the transparency um, that, uh, the digital arena gives us. Um, I open it up. Anybody want to try that one? I mean, I think certainly uh, being able to communicate directly with artists over Instagram has been one of the biggest uh, sea changes that I've seen in the art market. It has made uh, a lot of artists sort of be able to enter the market more directly. Uh, when I look at the reporting from that same Hiscox report, uh, the, the price point of work being sold directly through Instagram is relatively low. About 58% of the paintings uh, reported last year uh, were under $5,000 and 36% uh, were fully under $1,000. So especially for emerging artists who are entering the market, it can be a great way to connect directly and begin to make sales. However, I do think that um, galleries still serve a really tremendously valuable um, role in artists' lives. Um, in my, I've, like many people in the art world, I've had many careers. I actually went to school for art. I, have, I got an MFA, I was an exhibiting artist. Um, and there, I had a very active social media presence. I had opportunities and made sales through my Instagram back in the day. But uh, once I started showing with the gallery, I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I never under, uh, appreciated how much galleries do until um, I entered that space myself. And I think it, it depends on the kind of person you are, but being able to offload that, because it's a whole separate job really, self promoting yourself uh, and maintaining those relationships is a ton of work. Uh, so I think it's a really personal question to decide whether or not that's something that you feel comfortable continuing to own um, or entering into a, a really healthy relationship with a gallery that uh, believes in your work, is a champion for you and can help, um, help you with things you didn't even think you needed help with. Yeah, I, I mean, I side with, you know, Annie on the, 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 the Lux front because, and, and Tatiana on, on what the gallery provides. Cause I think they're, they're like, Guys have a particular role and function uh, in the art world, and and they're the bearer of this information. There's a lot of people who, you know, have who come into the art world where people defer to them. You know, like, you know, sometimes it's the one percent. It's 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 difficult sometimes for even people to transition in and be like, what do you mean you don't want to take my money? It's like, well, I get to choose who I you know sell this artist yeah. to, right? <laughs> um, but but it, it's it's the importance for that that I see that they play is they they allow you know people from the outside to be able to engage with culture right and while the the artists are doing what they do it allows us to be able to, sometimes they're a mirror to what's happening sometimes they're just they're just giving us back our mental space you know when when in the height of what we were dealing with with the pandemic when I got to be in my first gallery again seeing large paintings, large work, I, I felt like some of my soul was coming back, right? Yeah. And so it's really important, you know, yes, we love digital and we love, <laughs> we love how people engage, but that in-person experience, that will never go away. Like, like I, I, in, from my perspective, I think that's still valuable. And yes, we're seeing things with, you know, NFTs and, you know, non-fungible tokens and, and things like that. And, you know, the digital artwork that's playing on a whole nother, you know, uh, market that's disconnected uh, from the one that we're used to, uh, that you being in space connected to work, I think is something that, you know, uh, that's why I value the, the dealer and the gallery, right? And absolutely, and it's, oh, sorry. Uh, no, no, go ahead, Tatiana, please. 
the last thing I wanted to interject was, I think it's really important to also remember that these social media platforms are private for-profit spaces who will often uh, decide to censor artworks. Um, and will all, and frankly, there's an algorithm that tends to privilege a certain kind of artwork that's like easily digestible, photographs well, is fast. And so we don't want to lose sight of the fact that art is this really rich, vast thing. And not everything will, not everything will necessarily succeed on Instagram, but that doesn't mean it isn't great and couldn't find its audience perhaps in a gallery, in a physical space like that. Yeah, I, I totally echo Sean. Our city, New York, would be so much less rich without all of the galleries in Chelsea and the galleries on the Upper East Side or Lower East Side. Um, and I, I think that for you know gallery owners who, who might be watching us right now, we, we want you to survive. And I think that that is sort of the landscape that we're sitting in now. You know, does your digital presence match your brand? Yeah. Um, are you able to make sales online? Because the margins on sales online are probably better than if you, sorry, Tatiana, but exhibited at a fair. You know, th there's a tremendous operational and also marketing benefit to just understanding your digital opportunities. Um, but I, I totally agree, Sean, you know, our lives would be much, much less rich if we weren't able to walk into a gallery without a doubt. So speaking of that, uh, we have a great question here. Um, which is around uh, the transparency point that Sean made. And it, it's something that um, at least in my um, career, I also navigated around the transparency around pricing and, and publicly posting pricing. Some states require it or countries require it, some don't. It's always been a tricky space of do you, don't you? Um, and this question is asking, how do you promote and enforce transparency? I would love to understand the panel's view. My view is the the digital space is, is forcing it because it is there's so much information, there's databases, there's access. Um, I've been in the art market over 25 years and the evolution of the knowledge of the collector is just astronomical. And where they used to come to you for everything from A to Z, they come in basically understanding everything and telling you what it's worth, whether it's right or wrong. Uh, what they're going to pay or what it's worth and what they do and, and they, they tell you how to market it and et cetera. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Because I, I do think we're at a shifting point around this and that we are going to have to move towards this more transparent space. Um, Sean, you, do you want to open with that if you have thoughts, since it was your uh, comment? Yeah, I mean, the so we're going to be launching a, a, a collector, you know, focused product because I believe the collector is completely underserved. It, it, you know, and when you have conversations with collectors, you know, we're, we're, we have, you know, collectors that we're dealing with that are on, you know, boards of MoMA, LACMA, et cetera, all the way down to, to the novice co collectors, you know, so my closest homies are, are collecting and, 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 you know, wanting advice on how to do things. And so we're thinking from that lens and whether you like it or not, all of Wall Street is coming into the art world. Right, and Wall Street is a data-driven environment. It's how they think, it's how they function. Some people don't like when they come in and they just want to know, well, what, how's this thing going to go up and to the right, right? Like, <laughs> like when they come in by, and it's like, well, you got to love the thing first. You got to live with it, right? And that around transparency, I think you like you have to listen to the market. The market is craving for information. And for those who want to keep it insular and tight, well, you may keep that all the way to non-existence, right? Because if everybody else is going for that shift to visibility and understanding how the market is moving and what are the factors or variables that's making it move, well, you've got to provide answers to that or they're going to try and seek the answer elsewhere. And you know, th those who shift with the tide are the ones who are going to rise in the market, right? And so that, that's why I think the, the, what, what the pandemic has done is opened up the aperture of people's minds and receptivity to the fact that you can throw a price out there and your business will still exist. You'll still be able yeah. to do that, right? You don't need to hide it under lock and key and, you know, call me and let's go in my back office and do that. It's like, no, when, when we go shop, it doesn't matter if I'm, you know, trying to find Virgil's latest at Louis Vuitton, 
or I'm going to my grocery store because my daughter needs, you know, Cocoa Puffs, right? Like there's pricing visibility there and I get to understand and discuss and, and chat around it. It's not something to be afraid of, it's something to embrace and figure out how that relates to how you want to conduct your business. Yeah, exa exactly, Sean. You know, people aren't just buying art and they think about art within the context of their lives where, you know, there's a collector maybe is buying a yacht or $150 million Medigliani. Maybe it's to your example, a Wall Street guy who's 40 years old and makes a couple of million dollars a year and wants to start a collection. There are a lot of options out there. They can buy art from anywhere. Why make it hard for them? You know, it, it money is, I think, um, perceived sometimes by the art world as crass, even though we all, you know, effing love it. And uh, it's, just, uh, it's just a shame that we aren't, aren't more open about it, you know, because I think the rest of the world is and we're behind the ball on that. I was just gonna say that every other industry operates like this. So I don't see why the art world can't. And I think if we aren't more transparent about our pricing, um, well, ultimately, if we are more transparent about our pricing, it's going to encourage a greater confidence in the market, greater confidence, buying confidence. And that's ultimately what the art market needs. So, um, yeah. So we're almost out of time, uh, but I think we got a great question and, and it was asked by two people in kind of two different ways that I think is a great way to end this. Um, what are the necessary skills to develop for a career in the digital art world? Um, and, and we had a second part of it um, where a student was asking kind of um, to Sean's point about data and what that means and how do you define or build that in your, your profile. Um, why don't I start with uh, Annie, do you want to kick that off around any recommendations you have for this audience around building your, your uh, skills to, if you want to transition into more of a digital role or space? Yeah. I think that um, all good business people and employees, you know, should really want to learn what all of the digital opportunities are. Um, so for example, if you're a specialist at an auction house, you should have a basic understanding of digital channels so that when you're working with your marketing team, you really understand what they're proposing. And if you're a business owner, you know, you, you really should understand how important web design is and get someone to help you with that. Um, and, and certainly for yourself, you know, building a cogent online persona the way Sean has done um, is incredibly important and only increasingly so. I, I think that you have to believe in a way that um, digital marketing actually works or marketing period works, it's, it's like gravity. It applies to everybody, you know? And now there is so much data available about what's effective and what's not effective. It's really important for your business um, or for yourself to have some kind of basic understanding of that. And, and you know, we all gave some, some tips here about how to go about it. Louise, do you wanna leave us with a, a tip or two? Yeah, I mean, I think from, from my side, certainly looking in on Instagram, I think it goes back to the power of narrative. You know, that you're picking the right image, but you're really telling the story behind that image. Um, I've seen some, some great businesses, but actually also individuals um, telling some great narrative stories. I think from my side, it, it takes time. You know, you've got to put the time behind it. Um, so time management is a critical factor, allocating a certain, amount of time or an individual within the business to be focused specifically on that. Um, that's a kind of shift in, in, in management, I think, particularly for those businesses that were quite slow off the mark to develop their digital business. Um, so yeah, narrative storytelling. I mean, I think from an individual perspective, if you're out there on social and you're telling a great story and you're engaging people, not only is it great for your the business that you work for, it's great for your own personal brand um, and future-proofing your career as well. Sean, over to you. Yeah, I mean, the ladies <laughs> that are around are saying it best. Um, 
you know, an, you know, Annie in terms of the, the direction of like understanding the data, knowing who you're marketing to, um, you know, Louise and, and Tatiana both spoke to like storytelling uh, and brand. And I think that's, inc it's incredibly key. And being able to understand your own uniqueness and bringing forth authenticity. Like people just love it, you know, just who you are and what you do and not trying to mimic, you know, other people, just, just be you. You know, when I first came into the game, I was like in blazers and button ups and like trying to, you know, impress, you know, you know, this, this art world. And then I was just like, well, I just feel more comfortable in like, streetwear <laughs> <Right? Like, laughs> like you know do, doing what we do and, and, and understanding the environment the market like who's here how to how to be able to like where's where's our lane and and then leveraging our our own brand you know against that um and i encourage people to, to explore linkedin more like because i think like the, the the art world is like well that's so business and and whatever but <laughs> But more and more of the art world is is there. I mean, I think Andy, like years ago, I think that's probably the first place that I think I dropped you a line or vice versa yeah. was like on LinkedIn. And and so I think that to 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 just look into that platform and they've launched their own stories and things like that, and just figuring out how to how to leverage um, that platform in particular. Because every like we all know Instagram, but um, there's a lot of organic reach that you can get through LinkedIn that I think is interesting also. Thank you. I agree, Sean. Actually, the more that we get the art market onto LinkedIn, it's the better for the community because it is creating a transparency networking and community that's more formal. And particularly at times like this, I think it helps people help navigate their career path um, when it may be not at the space they want it. Uh, Tatiana, do you, we were about to run out of time, but do you have a, a quick piece of advice? Um, and then we'll, we uh, have a few things that we're to wrap up. All right, I'll try and make it really quick. It echoes a lot of what the others have said, but I think when it comes to being uh, online on social media is making sure you find a way to be authentically yourself. I'll close with an anecdote from AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, when she was giving a workshop to senior democratic leadership on how to improve their social media presence. She pointed out that she used to do Instagram lives while she was cooking in her kitchen, that was really popular. And then suddenly a bunch of other politicians suddenly started to do Instagram lives from their kitchen. And the point wasn't that she was in her kitchen, the point was that she was connecting with others authentically over something she loved doing. Um, and was already doing. So figure out uh, who you are in that space, what you love and take it from there. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Um, we're at an hour. We have so many questions we're going to have to, and we did not get to all of them. We might have to have a part two because uh, this is, we're getting lots of kudos, lots of, this is a very hot topic as we expected. Um, we get a lot of questions. We are recording this and this will be available on the, um, YouTube channel. I would also encourage everybody here, please follow um, Art Market Mentors on Instagram. Uh, we uh, post many inspirational notes and we're helping lots of people in the community. And um, thank you to the panelists. What a really great, um, great, great conversation. And uh, thank you so much for helping everybody. And, and we'll circle back around all these questions. Uh, maybe we do a part two, maybe we, we kind of try to do it in the old fashioned way in email. <laughs> So thank you. Oh, I waved. There we go. Thanks, Caroline. <laughs> Take Thanks care, everybody. Yeah, Have a appreciate great day. it, Caroline. Bye.